right? For the last two weeks, we've been talking about uh, breaking down this this chapter and verse, and we've uh, dug deep into it. I'm just going to do a quick summary, and let's just see where we take it today. Amen? Matthew 20, 30 says this. There were two blind men sitting beside the road. And when they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David. Somebody say, Lord, Son of David. Have mercy on us. Continue on. Be quiet, the crowd yelled at them, but they only shouted louder. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. When Jesus heard them, he stopped and called, What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they said, We want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes and instantly they could see. Then they followed him. Let's go back to the beginning. And we broke this down and gave a bit of context that Jesus was out of the city, uh, out of Jericho on his way. And there were two blind men sitting on the side of the road. And we talked about when you are blind, uh, it means that there is no vision. You cannot see. So... There were two blind men sitting on the side of the road, and the Bible doesn't even tell us their names. The writers doesn't feel the need to tell us who they were, but they were described by their predicament. They were described by their situation. They were described by their struggle. They were described by who everyone had known them to be. They were two blind men. In the same place sat over for how many years, we do not know, we're not privy to that information, but we know for certainty that they were blind. And when we talked about when you are blind, there is no vision. There is no sight. There is no, um, there is no, you're stuck in darkness. And we talked about what do you do when you are stuck in darkness? Uh, you need light. The Bible says the entrance of his word bring yet light. The Bible says that his word is a light onto your feet and a lamp onto your path. And we talked talked about if you feel like you are stuck in any kind of cycle or you feel like you are going through the motions where you have been in a place where you have no vision and you feel like you have no insight or direction what you need is a flood of light and we talked about getting the word of God amen and he says that they heard that Jesus was passing by and we kind of broke this down a bit further and said they heard uh, they could not see but they could hear uh, that Jesus was passing by and we don't know what's from the excitement of the crowd or the feet moving around but they heard that Jesus was coming by and we prayed a quick prayer and we said Lord let us hear you when you are passing by because we decided to break it down as well to say that you must understand that when Jesus passed by it was just not simply a physical thing where he was physically walking by the Bible talks about the fact that you know that the eyes of God search to and fro looking for those whose hearts are turned towards them and we know that the voice of God walks because in Genesis 3 the Bible says that the voice of God was walking in the garden Um, and so we said if the eyes of God is searching, that means his mouth is always speaking. That means God is always speaking. And in every season and area of your life, there is a word for you. And you have to be sensitive to make sure that you hear what God is saying. And for them, they heard that Jesus was passing by. And we broke it down a step further and talked about how, you know, when Jesus passed by, it was not just a physical thing. It wasn't as simple as that. We went back to the book of Exodus 33, when Moses would ask God a question and God, he would ask God to see his glory. He said, show me your glory and God said to Moses says no man can see my face Exodus 33 18 and live but he said here's what I will do I will hide you in the cleft of the rock and I will pass by you and my goodness you know will pass by and then he went along to say God to say I would have mercy on who I'll have mercy on and I'll have compassion on who I'll have compassion on and so we went to say that when God passes by goodness and mercy passes by as well And the only way to make sure that you have goodness and mercy is to be in the presence of the Lord because along with his presence comes goodness and mercy. Uh, And so when they would cry and they would say, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me it was not just a, uh, 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 it wasn't just vain utterances they were tapping into the understanding of what he knew and they asked for mercy to speak and we broke it down a, a step further last week and we looked at Hebrews 4 um, where we were talking about this and we spoke ex- extensively about entering into rest because the Bible speaks about how uh, there remaineth a rest the whole of Hebrews 4 talks about those who will not enter into this rest uh, because they do not believe and Bible talks about how there's evidence of this rest being made available because on the second day i'm sorry in the second chapter of genesis genesis 2 2 the bible says that at the end the seventh day god rested 
And he talked about how those, uh, there remain a rest for those who believe in him. And the only way to enter into this rest is to believe. And that it is a sad thing that many believers who exist today will live the whole of their lives and not enter into this rest because they do not believe. You know, here's the beautiful thing about, and here's the crazy thing about it. Whether or not it's made available, if you do not accept it or receive it or enter into it, uh, it has no significance or bears no impact on your life. Uh, if there is a nice fancy car and you stand and talk about how nice the car is and you talk about everything that it can do, but you need to get to Aja or you need to get to Ikoi or you need to get to Allen, if you don't get your butt in that car, no matter how fancy that car is, if you don't enter into it, it's not taking you anywhere. Isn't it interesting that a lot of us can talk about faith and talk about rest and talk about all these things and they're more like principles rather than life lessons. I mean, they're more like principles and things that we refer to, almost like we have this signboard mentality where we can point and say, this is what it is, but we actually don't see it in our lives. We talk about faith. Oh, every Christian talks about faith. <laughs> but the question is, do we really have faith? And when I say do we have faith, it's not a thing of how well can you talk about it. Uh, but how well do you live your faith? That's a whole different conversation. I've said this casually in passing many times that many Christians pray faithless prayers. And what do I mean by that? We pray prayers and when we pray, we don't expect it to be answered. Because when it does get answered, we're surprised. Which is an indication that we really didn't believe that it would happen. Right? Oh God, I want you to have like, yo, I have a testimony. God came through for me. And you're like surprised. And it's like, why are you surprised? Did you not believe? Blessed are those who, who um, he said to Thomas, he said, uh, for those who have seen me, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen me, uh, but yet believe. But yet believe. Yet believe. God spoke to the, the, the vine and he cursed it and he said, you shall no longer bear any fruit. And he walked away and it, it looked like it was alive and it looked like everything was, was the same. And then the next day they come to the vine and, and it's, it's, it's uh, dried up. And the disciples are like, oh my God, it's dried up. And he said, yeah, I, I cursed it. Forget what you see. The Bible talks about Jesus, who a God who calls things from the beginning, calls things that are not as though they were. So he's always speaking from the vantage point of the future. He doesn't deal in the present, he deals in the future. So everything that he says concerning you is not about your now, it's about what he's already been, where he's already been. And so his, his, his reality is our prophecy, if that makes any sense. Uh, what he has seen and experienced is what you have not walked in yet, but the ability to believe and hold on to it is what we call faith. Now, Hebrews 4 talked about how we cannot enter into it but through faith. And we have to believe that this rest has been made available. That means in our lives, if everything has been made available for us as far as be blessed with every spiritual blessing, then why do we worry? I dare to say that worry is a, is, is a sign of unbelief. Oh. Uh-oh. It got really quiet in this place. Oh, yeah, I got about 20 minutes here. I got to bear with me a bit more. Amen. Oh, I have faith. I have faith. I have faith. Do you really have faith? If you do, then Bible asks the question, why do you worry? Literally, why do you worry? If you know that you are taken care of, if you believe in a God that is all-powerful, a God who loves you, a God that is yours, he's yours and yours his, if you believe that you dwell in the sacred of the Most High and these things are not just things that we say and mantras and rhetoric, if you believe that you dwell in the secret place of the Most High and you really abide under the shadow of the Almighty, then why are you worried? It's either one or two things. It's either you don't believe or the shadow of the Almighty is whack one or two things right right isn't it interesting that you know if if i told you about this exceptional car i told you about uh say a jet or a plane or whatever it is the way you show me that you trust in the pilot that you have never seen is that you enter and you take your seat with confidence ain't never met this guy ever said not one word to this man you don't know who he is half the time we don't know who a pilot looks like his credentials where he's gone where he's been but we sit with confidence and we put our lives literally in the hands of a stranger literally you know when you watch movies you know i forget what it's called the one with leonardo dicaprio where he faked he was a young guy and he faked to be a pilot and he faked his, catch me if you can based on true life events by the way this young kid scams his way 
and pretends to be a pilot, gets a pilot's uniform, gets into the cockpit, sits down, not having a clue how to fly the plane. And he did this for years. Yo. Those things don't give me, <laughs> they don't give me <laughs> rest because these things can happen. But why don't we think about these things? Why don't we say, Asa, can you show me your credentials, your pilot license? How did you pass? Because somewhere in the back of your mind, you truly believe that the, 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 the airline that is run by men <laughs> have done their due diligence and would not put an unqualified person to drive the plane. But here we have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who has never slept or slumbered, the one who says and one who does and doesn't. When he says, he cannot undo. When he undo, he cannot do. When he speaks, no one can speak. When he moves, no one can stop. And then he says, I'm driving your life, but you question him. Ooh, drops mic. Every time you worry, you're, you're questioning the pilot of your life. If you really believe that your life is in his hands, then why do you worry? Every time you look at him and it's like, God, can you really? It's like, you're saying, really? It's like, he almost asks God, what's your credentials? He's like, what else do I got to show you? The sun, the moon, and the stars dance at my words. I tell them not to move. I say, go, and he goes. I say, stop, and they stop. The stars obey me. The earth, the earth is the Lord, and the earth is the earth's food stool. This, this is my domain. Everything... <laughs> responds to my voice without me nothing was made i said let there be and there was and now i want to drive your life you who i created by the way your atoms your cells the molecules the nucleus in your body the way your blood flows the stream everything your red blood white blood cells everything in your body the antibodies the things that you don't even know exist the protons the neurons the atoms everything i respond to my voice you want to question if i can really not only did I show you how much I loved you, I created you, and then I redeemed you, and I sent my son to die for you, and I let him die for your sake, and yet you question if I still love you? If I'll take care of you? How would you feel if you were questioned that way? But yet we believe. We trust. <laughs> we have faith. Do you really believe? He says, there is a rest that's been made available, but we have to enter in. We have to enter into this rest. We have to believe this rest. We have to receive this rest because it does nothing for you in your life if you don't receive it. He says, let the weak say, I am strong. He's not saying it. This is different to motivation. It's not a motivational speaker. It's telling you what he's done. It's not, he's not telling you what, he, uh, he's not making you promise. He's telling you what he's already done, what has already been made available. I gave an example about two Sundays ago about a woman who had never flown before. Her son decided to fly her out for the first time and he buys her first class ticket, but she'd never been on a plane. So she sits on the plane and they bring the menu of what to eat. It's like, ah, oh, no, I don't, ah. Huh? <laughs> Three options. <laughs> you know, you know, you had your salmon, you had your salad, you had a steak. It's like, no, 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 no. Eh? Salmon, salad, salad. <laughs> Steak. She said, no, no, I want you, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I don't want anything. Hey. The came back. She's like, no, because see, I know how these people, when you order, that's how they'll catch you. Let me not embarrass myself, she thought. Let me just sit in my, you know, jejeli. <laughs> let this plane land. Let me get up where I'm going and let them not kick me out. This one that I'm inside, because first of all, in her mind, a part of her didn't even feel like she deserved to be there. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that we do that to ourselves so many times and we disqualify ourselves with the idea that we don't deserve to be? The reason why you are is not because of anything you've done. The reason why you are is because he is. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's nothing about you, what you've done or what you can't do or how well or how not well or how much you've done or how much you've received. It has nothing to do with you. We are saved simply by the grace. I have mercy, the Bible says, on who I have mercy on. Compassion, not because you did anything to warrant my compassion and my mercy, says God. Not because you are the most perfect person. It's because of the nature of who I am. The one that loves in spite of. My love is not based on you, what you do or what you don't do. It's based on who I am. So everything you are and everything that you get in life is because of everything that he is. And so saying like the way the woman is on the plane, she didn't buy a ticket. She had nothing. She was there based on the goodwill of her son. We are here based on the goodwill and the love of God. 
Yes, you didn't pay the price her son did. Guess what? Yes, you won't pay the price. The price has already been paid by this son. Sitting in that plane, we, there we are sitting in the plane of life, not trying to do much because we don't, we just feel like, let's, you know, you know, I'm not really supposed to be here, so let me, let me, let me be here and just kind of my, no, everything's made available. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing before the foundations of the earth. Everything that we'll ever need pertaining to life, pertaining to life and godliness, life, life and life. We talk about life. Life is physical. Everything pertaining to your physical life. You've been blessed with. And the woman stayed on that plane and she was hungry. How many of us go through life hungry? Not eating what has been made available for us. Right? Hungry. <laughs> and she landed. I said, Mama, she said, Son, please, can you just make me small eba and eba? And I put, when she was on a 16 hour flight, then the priest said, Ah. No, I didn't let them catch me. Oh. I just did. But they just like, Mom, what are you talking about? Everything in that seat. Because you are in that seat, everything belonged to you. As a matter of fact, some of this, you know, you can even get a massage for free. Everything. Hey, Lord, may we be... <laughs> May we not be those who miss out on what you have done. He says, unfortunately, there are people who will not enter this rest. And we spoke about that. That if you're in the presence of God, if you remain in the presence of God and you have goodness and mercy, then you will always be in a place of rest. When goodness, the good nature of God, when mercy always forgiving you and knowing that there's nothing you will ever do that will remove you from his will. And talking about if because of the high priest who has been, who, who stands before us in the city for the father, this is Hebrews 4. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace so that you can obtain mercy. There's a movie called Limitless, I believe. It says, you know, talking about, imagine if there was a pill. What if um, you took a pill and what would like all your fears, yeah, your fears, like what if you, you took a pill and all your fears didn't exist and you were limitless, like you could do anything. Your inhibitions, your fear, like you took a pill and all of a sudden you could see clearly. Ladies and gentlemen, for us, there is actually a pill called mercy that says there's nothing that you will ever do that will disqualify you. And yes, people talk about, yo, let's not preach this, this message of grace because you give people uh, the, the, the free will to, to bastardize it and take it for granted. But let me tell you, uh, the, <laughs> I say this all the time, the um, opportunity cost or, of, of grace is, is abuse. It is. And what do I mean by that? Whatever you don't pay for, there's a guarantee that to some level of degree you will abuse because you didn't pay for it. But God, knowing that my children will possibly abuse this grace, says every day there's still grace topped up every day, fresh made anew. So there is now no bondage or no fear of failure or no fear of disqualification. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. And it's not saying that you have to continue to do stuff to maintain your freedom. Your freedom was not based on your actions. Who the Son sets free is free free indeed obtain mercy says come boldly and we talked about rest and I began to you know we went Ugh. we went to step further and how they spoke about son of David have mercy on me and I looked at that line that covenant line son of David have mercy on me and you know I started to think who is the son of David we remember in second Samuel when David would um say to the, to the prophet Nathan that he wanted to build uh, the house of the Lord. He said, why am I in a house of, you know, and the Lord stays in tents and wanted to build the Lord a house. It's the second Samuel 7. And um, Nathan says to David, go do everything in your heart to do. And that night the Lord came to him and said, because of what you have said or what you have done, um, your seed will always sit on the throne forever a kingdom that will never end. And if you look at Jesus' genealogy, you know that Joseph is of the line of David and because he was born to Mary and he entered that line through Joseph who accepted him as his son, he was referred to his name as the son of David. The son of David was the Messiah that had been prophesied that would come and would set them free. 
and would deliver them from the tyranny of the rule of, 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 of the Roman Empire then. So a lot of people, when they began to hear and see what Jesus was doing, his ability to heal, his ability to set free and deliver, they began to call him, this must be the Messiah. And so when they called him son of David, they were calling him the Messiah. He said, son of David, have mercy on me. And if you look at the character David in himself, you realize that this was a man who the Bible refers to as a man after God's heart. A man after God's heart. A man who was always, always in the good books of God. And you know, there are not too many people that in the Bible that talks about how God gave rest. One of them was David. The Bible says that God gave David rest on every side. Rest on every on every side. And I want to say that really quickly to you. I want to pray and say over oh, you that you will receive rest on every side. And when I say every side, I mean emotionally, I mean physically, I mean spiritually, I mean financially, I, I say it mentally. In every side, you will receive rest because rest is available. And we got to ask myself the question, the man that God gave rest to, what was his thinking? How did he think? How did he enjoy this rest? What was his thought? And you begin to look through the Psalms and you see that the Psalms are repute with many thoughts. His thoughts that he will put into, into verses and his thoughts that he will put into words. You know, when we'll talk about you are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. And whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. And, and I began to give an indication and a quick way to enter into rest. Anytime you feel like your, 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 your peace is being disturbed, enter into rest. And how do you do that? Uh, you enter into worship. You enter into worship, you know, because worship has a way of reminding you or taking you to places. David will always sing in different times of distress. The Bible says he was a man after God's heart. He would make melodies in his heart and he would sing. You are my hiding place. You are the one that I run to. You are the one to hide in God. You're the one that I retreat to, that I, I take shelter in. You're the one that covers me. You're the one that fills my heart with songs of deliverance. When you feel like you're in trouble, fill your heart with songs of deliverance. He says, whenever I am afraid, when fear tries to creep up, replace it with faith. He says, I, I, I choose to trust in you. And he would say stuff like Psalm 23. He was talking when he says, the Lord is my shepherd. And you must understand that he referred to God as a shepherd because he was a shepherd himself. You see, you can only refer to God in the way that you have experienced him. You see, his reference points to God was based on how he had been a shepherd. And what kind of shepherd was David? David was the kind of shepherd that he would fight for his sheep. And when he would face Goliath, he said, when the lion and the bear came to try to take one of my sheep... I fought and I removed it from the mouth of the lion and the bear and I will do the same to you. In other words, he put his life on the line for his sheep. He was willing to fight for his sheep. He was willing to die for his sheep. He was willing to protect his sheep. So when he says that the Lord is my shepherd, in other words, God is there and if God is there, then what can happen to me? God will not sit by and allow anything destroy me. God is my shepherd. The Bible says all things work together for good for those who believe and trust and love him. So if anything is happening in your life, then it must be for your good. It cannot be, it cannot be to destroy you. It cannot be to break you. I can't imagine when Job was going through his process and he was sitting there saying, God, how far? Because trust me, live life longer, love. You have situations that will make you say, God, how far? <laughs> it's like you know I can't imagine being Job and thinking how are all of this going to work out for my good but the Bible says that when God will restore him he will restore 10 times in other words the latter was better and greater than the former isn't it interesting that we always dwell on the sacrifice and the suffering but never about the victory and the restoration to think about it when we talk about Joseph's story we always talk about everything he went through most of the time, Joseph's story is he was sold, thrown in prison, he was a slave, <laughs> they lied on him, <laughs> and then we don't emphasize so much on <laughs> he became the prince of Egypt, he became the prince of the world, <laughs> his latter was better than the former, we just focus on <laughs> his trials and tribulations. The Bible says that the latter will always be greater than the former. 
It says all things work together. All the good, the bad, the ugly. What we understand and what we don't understand. Things that make sense, the things that don't make sense. It says the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means I will lack no good thing. Put, put, put it on the board, Psalm 23. Um, I will lack nothing. I will not need to want for anything. Put the amplified version up there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Lack will never be in my life. Everything that I need, the shepherd knows what the sheep needs. Before the sheep knows that he has need of it. It is the shepherd's responsibility to think for the sheep. To provide for the sheep. To guide the sheep. To fight for the sheep. To die for the sheep if necessary. All the sheep has to do is follow the shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. If you know that God is a sh good shepherd, then you have to trust when he speaks. And all you have to do in this life is follow. You know, I, I say this all the time. I feel like growing up is a scam. How I miss being a child again. Like I, you know, <laughs> what worries do they have? My kids. Oh, dad, can I? <laughs> my son wake up at 3 a.m. Ah, the boy. It's my sunshine. Yes. Wake up there and be like, Daddy, I want milk. Daddy, I want milk. <laughs> Daddy, I want... See, he didn't ask if there is milk. <laughs> Understand the tenses. He didn't ask where is the milk or if there is milk. Or Daddy, did you buy milk? Or Daddy, do you have money to buy milk? His simple utterance is, Daddy, I want milk. And as he's saying he wants milk, he believes and knows that the milk will appear. What kind of milk? Doesn't matter. Where the milk will come from? Doesn't care. How the milk is going to reach him? He's not bothered. But he knows that if he says, Daddy, I want milk, it is Daddy's responsibility to get milk. And sure enough, <laughs> sleeping half asleep, Daddy is tired. But I have a daddy that is never sleeps or slumbers. Let's not forget. My daddy, his daddy who is tired. And he's tired. He's sleeping in bed. And he's weak. He's like, oh, God. But guess what? The love I have for him will push me out of the bed. I say, oh, this boy. And he will laugh. <laughs> like he just did now. Because <laughs> that's what I'm talking about him. <laughs> he will laugh. <laughs> and I will get him. I say, look at this boy. He's looking at me like, what? But I'm your son. What? I'm like, huh? And I go down the stairs. And I open the door. And it's three in the morning. I'm half asleep. But I put it in the cup and then I warm it up because I know he likes warm milk <laughs> while he's still sleeping <laughs> and I take his milk back up the stairs and I open the door and I put it in his hand and he takes it and I say what do you say I have to remind him he says oh thank you daddy <laughs> and while he's asleep he drinks the milk and finishes the milk half asleep and passes the empty cup to me and rolls over and goes back to sleep. And then God says, if your earthly father, come on somebody, knows how to give good gifts to you. He says, see, and he talks to him, he says, see what you do for your son. You see, but, but you see, the difference between you and I is before, while you were asleep, before, before you were born, I knew that on this date, on this time, in this location, you would need milk. And so before I created you, I created all the milk that you would ever need. In anticipation of the time where you will perchance turn and say, Dad, I need... No, no, son. Before you ask, because I put the desire in you, I know what you need. Everything you will ever need has been made available. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The next line, he says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures green pastures green was intentional to show you that, that it is it's an abundance it is full of nutrients it is what they need the sustenance everything that he needs or the sheep would need because they are pastures and they are green pastures if there were if there was no difference he wouldn't specify green green he makes you lie down anyone that's telling you to lie down that means he's standing up both of us can lie down together 
A lot of times you have people standing on the wall. They're always, they're always, they're always soldiers on the wall while others rest. Because should there be any danger, should there be anything that's coming, the ones on the wall sound the alarm. They're the first line of defense. A shepherd, when he puts the sheep to lie down, that means he's standing up. A shepherd doesn't put the sheep <laughs> to, to lie down with him laying down. He's standing up. When God has asked you to lie down and trust him, that means he's standing up. He says, I will fight your battles. And all you have to do is hold your peace. The Bible says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He says, lie down in green pastures. Lie down. He knows your green pastures. He knows what pastures are green for you. He knows where you need to be. He knows where to take you. He makes me lie down, David says, in green pastures. And then he leads me beside still and quiet waters. In other words, in life there will be raging storms, but he takes me to the place of peace. The Bible says that he is my peace. Or the song says, sorry, he is my peace. When, when troubles come, Jehovah sees and Jehovah knows. So we talked to a preacher someone a couple of weeks ago how Jesus walks on storms. There is no storm that he can't walk on. He, he leads me beside quiet waters, tranquil waters. In quietness and confidence, the Bible says, shall be your strength. <laughs> he leads me beside the still waters. And the next verse, it says this, he refreshes and restores my soul if your soul needs oh, my time, I'm going to end it right here <laughs> it's already 1 o'clock right? Um, if you feel like you need to be refreshed and you feel like your life needs to be restored, I got somebody who does that, he refreshes and restores he restores, that means he gives you back everything that you've lost he restores everything that was lost, broken, damaged or stolen, he restores why we have insurances for things like this. If your thing is damaged, property is damaged, stolen, or broken, guess what? Because you pay insurance, they come back and they restore to the value of what was lost. But I got news for you. He says, I'll give you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He restores. Really quickly, with every head bowed in this place, I want us to open our hearts and begin to pray. And if you have been that person or you are that person who needs faith, say, God, give me faith. If you're someone who feels like you've lost anything or you've lost a part of you or you've lost the essence of who you are, ask God to restore right now. And if you're here and you're hearing me and maybe you're online, you say, you know what? I want the Lord to be the shepherd of my soul. I want him to be the good shepherd. I want him uh, to be my hiding place. I want him to be the one that leads me beside the still waters and, 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 and leads me to green pastures. Uh, the shepherd of my soul. I want that to be me. I, I want to know this God you're speaking of. And I want to give my heart to him. And I've never, had, never done it before. I want you to say this prayer with me. And if you're here and you haven't given your heart to Christ and you want to do it, I just want you to say this prayer with me wherever you might be. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you because you are the shepherd of my soul. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your son. I thank you for the sacrifice and the price that you paid. I ask you, oh God, to come into my life. Be my Lord. Savior, be the shepherd of my soul. I give you full control. From now on, I am yours and you are mine. From now on, you are the shepherd of my soul. In Jesus' name. Father, according to the profession of their words, we thank you that your word says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things have passed away and all things have become new. We thank you for the newness of life that they have found in you, those who might have prayed this prayer in their hearts, here or online. We thank you that what you start 
you are always complete. So we ask you to accept our worship. We ask you to accept our praise. We ask you to accept our prayers. With thanksgiving. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.